this lecture, we're going to look at the emergence of local text forms and see how that has an impact on the transmission of the text. What we'll talk about is what a text type is. Uh, we're going to talk about the three or four text types that we're dealing with. And we will note that the nomenclature is disputed uh, today by some scholars. And yet, it's still serviceable for understanding the transmission of the text. Now, I'll get to the definition of a text type here on the next slide. But um, I'll mention that we have four groups of manuscripts that have traditionally been called text types. Sometimes it's reduced just to three. One group is known as the Alexandrian text type or the Alexandrian family. That's manuscripts that have uh, traditionally been associated with Alexandria, Egypt. And they were, uh, if, if, there, if there's a strong association, and most scholars would think there is, Alexandria was the most important center in the ancient world for faithful, accurate copying of literary texts. Uh, in fact, the library in Alexandria was considered the, the largest and most important library of the ancient world. Uh, that uh, it, it was destroyed at two or three different times in history uh, before uh, Christianity even w was even born uh, was the first time. But Alexandria nevertheless had this great tradition of very careful, very faithful copies of manuscripts. Then what's called the Western, and this is usually put into quotes, is a group of manuscripts that didn't originate in the West, ended up in the West, but really spread throughout the Roman Empire. It's a very popular text form. And to even call it a text form might be too generous of a statement. It's just uh, almost freewheeling copies of manuscripts that went in a number of different directions. Uh, it paraphrases, it drops verses, it adds verses, it changes wording. It uh, adds a number of uh, phrases here and there that uh, in the uh, Book of Acts, for example, it's almost 10% longer than the Alexandrian text form. And we'll ta talk about... Well, we've already talked about why that is because of the canon and how before the, the text was viewed as canon, probably the Western text was adding these things, some of, of which was from personal reminiscences, some of which was, well, we think this may have happened. Then there's the Byzantine text form, which grew up really beginning in the 4th century, most likely, and it migrated to the East. It's really where it started in Byzantium, called Constantinople at times, uh, today, it's known as Istanbul. That's where uh, Emperor Constantine moved the capital in the 4th century. And 90% uh, of our manuscripts today are Byzantine. And 90% of our manuscripts are from the 9th century or later. Uh, there, that's not accidental, that relationship. Uh, most of the manuscripts in Greek come from that region. And once Constantine moved the capital of the empire to uh, Constantinople, Greek began to, began to have a very shrinking influence on the west of the rest of Europe. So Western Europe began to speak in Latin everywhere. Greek was now having an influence only in Turkey and in Greece. And that's one of the reasons we have almost twice as many Latin manuscripts of the New Testament as we do of Greek. is because that spread throughout the whole Roman Empire. And, and today we have languages that are based on Latin. Fren French is based on Latin, Spanish. Italian, Romanian, even uh, and Portuguese, even English to, to some extent because of the Norman invasion. What languages do we have that are based on Greek? Absolutely none. It doesn't have any descendants. It does in terms of its alphabet, but that's it. Russian and uh, Coptic and a couple of other languages, but no actual descendants. It began to have a shrinking area of influence, although its area of influence was virtually all Christianized. So Constantine is the first emperor to say um, Christianity is a legal re religion. He has 50 Bibles made for the capital. And so you've got a high concentration of those who call themselves Christians in one area, and it becomes virtually the only place where Greek is spoken. Well, you're, you're going to have these manuscripts looking a lot like each other. And uh, the further you go, you can have more and more of these copies for a pretty small area, relatively speaking, but they'll all look like each other. Then you've got the Caesarean text, and we're not sure, uh, even if there is such a text form, but it would have probably been a kind of a precursor to the Byzantine moving in the same direction. We'll talk about the, what each of these text types looks like. Um, 
but the Caesarean would have been absorbed by the Byzantine. Uh, most scholars today probably say the Caesarean text never existed, so we'll, we'll wrestle with that a little bit, but we'll talk about the definition a little bit more later in the next slide. But, uh, at least you get the four basic text types here, and then we'll talk about some of their features and when they would have originated later. Uh, as I said, this nomenclature is disputed by some textual critics today. Uh, they are starting to say text type is not a, a good term because it doesn't relate necessarily to those regions. And to some extent that's true, but we're going to use it because it's still serviceable for our understanding. So we'll call it text type, text form, or family. Those things essentially mean the same thing. Now, let me illustrate a text type this way. And here's where I'll, I'll define it. A text type is the largest group of manuscripts with shared readings, largest group apart from the fact that all manuscripts, in some sense, are copies of the New Testament. So if I could say these manuscripts, although they're copies of the New Testament, look more like each other than they do something else, and it's a very large group, I'd call that a text type. Now, to illustrate this, I, I can do it with... Say we still don't have the printing press today, we don't have Xerox machines, we don't have typewriters, and we don't have computers. We don't have fax machines. We don't have any way to duplicate something exactly the same. We don't have cameras. So if we had the NIV, the New American Standard, the King James Bible, and we didn't have Gutenberg and all the rest of the technological trappings, what would those uh, books look like? Well, those translations would be copied by hand. And let's say somebody uh, grew up in, um, the, the NIV is strongly associated with Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, the New American Standard Bible with Talbot Seminary, the King James with Westminster Abbey, Oxford University, and Cambridge University. So let's say somebody grows up in England, and all he knows is the King James Bible, moves to America, decides to go to seminary in Chicago, well, what he's going to do now is get the NIV. That's what they really teach. Well, as he's copying out scripture, as he's going to do as a scribe, sometimes he's going to put in the King James reading, the King James wording, uh, either because he remembers it better. It's got a great cadence, easy to, to memorize. Uh, or maybe even because it's a willful change or sometimes it's a subconscious change. This is one of those, this is for free. You won't get tested over this material. But, um, <laughs> I've asked people who have grown up, say, with the uh, New American Standard or, or the NIV in particular, and I said, okay, quote John 3.16 for me. You know what version they quote from? King James. Everybody quotes from the King James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. As soon as you say begotten, that's not NIV. Now, sometimes we modernize the King James a little bit, but that's King James. It's not NIV. Uh, and so... There's certain cadence to it that we can memorize, and sometimes that can impact us as we're writing down Scripture. So we have mixture in our extant manuscripts, the manuscripts that still exist today. That's what extant means. Uh, that is, there's not a single pure manuscript of any text form that we have today, except for some late Byzantines that purely represent the later Byzantine text form. But uh, all the rest of these manuscripts have mixture of various text forms. And that's because you get these people that are cross-pollinated. In the ancient world, you could move pretty darn rapidly. It wouldn't take uh, very long to move from one part of the Roman Empire to the other because of the great Roman roads and because of the Pax Romana. So you have peace throughout the empire. You're not having to deal with um, uh, passport control and customs agencies nearly as much as we do today. Uh, okay, let me illustrate this with the last verse of Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, 53. Jesus has just ascended into heaven. And here the disciples are in the temple, and they were in the temple blessing God, or they were in the temple praising God, or they were in the temple blessing and praising God. The Alexandrian manuscripts have blessing God. The Western manuscripts have praising God, a different verb in Greek. The Byzantines have blessing and praising God. That's an illustration of these text types where there's patterns of readings that are different. And you could catch this pattern of reading difference if you listen to a Bible, you know, you hear your pastor reading from the scripture, he doesn't tell you what Bible he's using. You say, oh, that's NIV, or oh, that's King James. And, and you know it because of the patterns of readings. You don't have to have that in front of you to tell them. And so that, that's how some of these things came about. Well, let me uh, move on to uh, 
text types and numerical preponderance, some general considerations here. What does numerical superiority prove? This first manuscript, the one on the left, has 16 copies. The second manuscript has only five copies. The first manuscript has three generations of copies, and the second manuscript has just two generations. Numerical superiority is due to the historical conditions uh, that these manuscripts went through in, in various regions, and it doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the text. Now, we'll discuss later whether this model that I've just shown here is accurate for the New Testament manuscripts. But another thing to note here is that a later manuscript may be more valuable than an early one. And you can see that in, in the text on the right that this so-called third generation written at the same time as, as these other manuscripts actually is a direct copy from that local original, if you will. So what textual scholars do is they do not count manuscripts to decide what the original is. They weigh the manuscripts. And these text types, one way to think about it is that basically, and, and this is oversimplified, but all of our Alexandrian manuscripts go back to a single ancestor. All of our Westerns go back to a single ancestor. All of the Byzantines go back to a single ancestor. Again, this is oversimplified. We're going to complicate things for you later, but for now, I'll keep it simple. So basically, if I have all these Alexandrian manuscripts agree, I could say it goes back to that one ancestor, and when was that ancestor produced? Rather than counting the manuscripts, I weigh them. And uh, so this is where I want to give you the consideration of text types and genealogical solidarity. So this first group, text A, we might even call this the Byzantine text. It has a lot of descendants. And uh, it looks like we've got seven descendants in that final generation. While as in text B, we've got just three descendants uh, that, are, that are still in existence. The, the red means it still exists. Can we reconstruct the local original from these extant copies? We can be pretty darn confident that we can because if they all agree with each other, that's probably going back to that local original several generations back. Uh, and so that becomes very helpful for us. But again, it's only one local original. So text A, even though it's got seven manuscripts today, doesn't mean that counts as seven votes for what the original New Testament is. It goes back to that text A, which gets one vote. These three manuscripts that are representing text B, they don't each get individual votes. It goes all the way back to text B, which gets one vote. That's, that's one of the ways to think about this. Again, I'm oversimplifying it, but it, it's good to think about this to begin with. But is it possible that a single manuscript represents the archetype against all other witnesses? And once again, you can see in text A, you've got this last generation where the fifth manuscript over actually skips a generation back. It goes to the first generation of copies, and that's what it's actually copied. It might stand alone against all the rest of the other witnesses and have the original reading. It would be very rare when it did that, but it hypothetically could do that. Same with text B, that second manuscript could go back uh, to the original against the other two. So these are the complications that textual critics deal with. Uh, it's not rocket science, but it's also um, not simple mathematics, and it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. Okay, so we're, we're wrestling with these manuscripts this way. Now, uh, continuing on on the text types, let's talk about the four basic text types. The Alexandrian text, I think we have firm evidence that it has roots very deep in the second century. In other words, 100, 110, something like that. And that it was not an intentionally edited text, but just a faithful stream of copies. In fact, uh, Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman in their book, uh, The Text of the New Testament, argue that it's a careful tradition going back very, very early. Uh, then you have the Western text, which also is very early in the second century. It has roots deep in the second century. It's widespread. It seems to be, in some respects, a more popular text form than the Alexandrian in the early centuries. Uh, but it's, it also doesn't seem to have a recension. It, it, it's very loosely called a text form. This text, virtually all of our Western manuscripts are either not in Greek or they're in Greek plus another language. They're diglots, Greek on one side, Latin on the other side of the page. That suggests it's probably a missionary text. It was meant for uh, spreading the gospel beyond the Greek regions. And it's the most amorphous of these text forms. How do we, it's like herding cats. You know, the Western manuscripts just seem to be going all over the place. They don't, they don't agree with others, nor that much with themselves.
Then you've got the Byzantine text, which is the most uniform of all the text types. And it probably has roots early in the 4th century, parts of it maybe are uh, 3rd century. But it becomes increasingly widespread, at least as far as Greek manuscripts are concerned. And it involves a heavy recension, that is, strong editorial activity takes place at uh, three key points for the Byzantine text. And it's motivated by the lit liturgy of the church. They would be uh, uh, reading various scriptures uh, each day in church. And those scriptures would be introduced um, with, uh, if you were just reading along in the text, you're going to read a pronoun where he said to them. Uh, and so they would want to change those pronouns to something like Jesus said to his disciples, which is what you get in a liturgically motivated uh, text. So you, if you're reading a portion of scripture in church and you have to start with pronouns, you're going to change that to the nouns. And that's going to impact the form of the text that is copied. And so the Byzantine is actually longer. It has more material than these other text types, and especially this clarifying, uh, edifying, explanatory material. Uh, the Caesarean is possibly non-existent. That is, it might not even be a real text type. We're not sure. Uh, but uh, it's probably found in the Gospels, if it is, and it probably was from the third century. The, the problem with the Caesarean is it seems to be completely or almost completely absorbed by the Byzantine text. So you can't distinguish Byzantine readings from Caesarean readings, except in a couple of places that are really fascinating. We'll look at uh, one of those. Okay, still drinking water from a fire hose. So here's how reason eclectics, which is the standard view of textual criticism today, would view these uh, text types. Other things being equal, the Alexandrian solidarity, that is where you have the Alexandrian witnesses agreeing with each other, that would probably be what the reading of the autograph is. Of course, other things are not equal, and we often don't have Alexandrian solidarity. So uh, those are some issues. But if that's the case, it's typically a slam dunk. Not always, but pretty close. The Western text, it's early, but it's erratic. Strong internal evidence is needed to make a claim of authenticity. We'll talk about internal evidence. That has to do with what would the scribe be likely to have written? What is the author likely to, to have written? I'll, I'll, we'll discuss one major Western reading that I think is authentic against the world. It's Western contra mundum. Um, and so because it's so early, we can't just throw it out. But because it's so erratic, we can't accept it. So we're, we're kind of in a no man's land here. It has to have compelling evidence on its side that would suggest, oh yeah, this is authentic and I can see why all the other manuscripts would have changed the text. Then the Byzantine text is later, probably a secondary text for the most part, and yet it can have some authentic readings that seem to slip through the net. I take it that the Byzantine is essentially based on the Alexandrian and the Western and the Caesarean. But we'll, we'll talk about that, that later. That Even though it's a later text form, 4th century, early 4th century, there are a few occasions, very few actually, where I think the Byzantine text and virtually the Byzantine text alone has the original wording. The Caesarean Caesar, uh, is a later secondary text, a precursor to the Byzantine. Very few authentic readings slipping through the net. So it's very much like um, the Byzantine text. Okay, that gives you, I know this is all theoretical, we'll try to give you some examples uh, later, but not in this lecture. Now, let me conclude this lecture with the emerging dominance of the Byzantine text. And here's the question that we want to wrestle with to, to conclude this. 90% of our Greek New Testament manuscripts are Byzantine. Why? There are some who'd say, well, it's because they represent the original. The original will always have uh, the majority of manuscripts on its behalf. That's what you get from uh, majority text people. The textus receptus people argue something similarly. Uh, I don't think that's the case, and that would be the case only if we're dealing with uniform copying. And by that, what I mean is that the copying was done uh, consistently where each manuscript had five copies done at this point, those each had five, you know, something along those lines. So I'm going to give you some reasons as to why the Byzantine text uh, later on from the 9th century on began to dominate. First of all, as I said, 90% of all Greek New Testament manuscripts are Byzantine. How can we explain this? Does the majority equal the original? And let me give you some reasons, six reasons for its dominance. The first is the Diocletian persecution. 
Emperor Diocletian persecuted Christians in a way that makes him infamous in the annals of church history. It's considered the worst persecution uh, of the church uh, in the ancient uh, world. Uh, from 303 to 311, AD 303 to 311, he issued three edicts. Uh, he said, uh, destroy the churches, burn their sacred texts, and imprison and sometimes even kill uh, their leaders. Uh, sometimes even whole villages that were mostly populated by Christians but had non-Christians, he would just level to the ground, kill all the people. Uh, remarkable um, persecution. Well, the basic result in terms of the manuscripts that we see is that Diocletian uh, really persecuted the church in the east and in the south, but in the west, it was in, in Rome and that area, it wasn't touched as much. So that's where we have a number of manuscripts that were just wiped out. And one of the fascinating results of this is this. This is, we'll talk about Codex W later. Uh, it's the most important manuscript in America. Uh, and it's uh, at a, a Smithsonian Institution. This manuscript was produced in the late 4th, early 5th century. And the, early, uh, the first editor of it, a guy by the name of Henry Sanders, said, Codex W is a patchwork gospel. It's got all four gospels in it. But it, it, its text form changes between the Alexandrian, the Western, what may even be the Caesarean or something like that, and the Byzantine. It kind of keeps going all over the map, right in the middle of a gospel. How do you explain that? What Sanders said is probably the scribe who put this together is doing it on the basis of partial gospel manuscripts that he finds that were the residue that Diocletian had not been able to destroy. And I think he's right. Uh, one of my students has done some work on this without even realizing he had done work on this. And uh, we'll talk about uh, what he's done that I think has demonstrated that Sander Sanders is really onto something here. Then um, we have, at about this time uh, during the Diocletian persecution, there's a fellow by the name of Lucian of Antioch. And he had done a text of the Old Testament. Uh, he was the probable progenitor, the originator, of the Byzantine text form. He died in 310, towards the end of the Diocletian persecution. And we see from his text of the Old Testament the way in which he tried to uh, do the text. But here's the thing. Here's a guy who's a textual scholar. He used manuscripts. He was used to compiling them and uh, publishing a new edition. This is during the persecution. It's not a time where you want to advertise. Oh, by the way, I'm Lucian. I'm doing this new edition of the text. Uh, uh, there are people who have said, no, there's no way Lucian could have done it. How come we don't have a shred of this in history? Well, Christians were being persecuted when he's doing this. You don't want to make any kind of uh, statement to that effect. But uh, even Jerome seems to say that, yeah, Lucian did this. His point would not be to make an accurate text as much as it would be to preserve every drop of the textual tradition. If Diocletian is destroying manuscripts left and right, and you're not sure if it's blessing God or praising God, what do you do? You put blessing and praising God in Luke 24, 53. And that seems to be a major motive for what Lucian would have done. Now, also shortly after this, you have Constantine commissioning 50 Bibles, maybe based on Lucian's text, we're not sure. But such a text would instantly have an impact on the church in the east. So let's, let's move right to that. Constantine, the next emperor, moved the capital to Byzantium from Rome, uh, which then was called Constantinople. He made Christianity legal, and it became the official religion of the empire. He commissioned Eusebius to produce 50 Bibles in Greek for the churches of Constantinople. And, and these three events coalesced to shrink the geographical influence of Greek while simultaneously increasing its control in the production of the text. So you have a smaller area where Greek is being used. And in that area, if it all becomes Christianized, it's kind of like saying Dallas is all Christian and Oklahoma City is Muslim. Well, which one is going to have more copies of Scripture? Well, probably Dallas would. Um, but uh, the, the fact is it's a smaller area. You have tighter controls because of that, and you have massive production because of how many churches needed this. With more Christians per square mile in a smaller region, the text will be more uniform and you'll get a lot of copies of it. Okay, 
So that's the second thing, Constantine and Constantinople. Third, Latin as the lingua franca of the West. Uh, as it swept across Western Europe, now you have a very large area where Christianity is having an impact. You've got fewer controls over Bible translation over a larger area. So the Western text, it's so amorphous, it's hard to, it, again, it's like herding cats. It's hard to make it look like one text form. And we have almost twice as many Latin manuscripts as we do of Greek. Uh, Jerome was commissioned to clean up the text because of this lack of standardization. And so he actually moved to Israel, uh, to Bethlehem, where he spent 35 years so he could learn Hebrew. And the region, I mean, this guy was just a dedicated scholar and had the, the, the wealth of the Vatican to basically um, grab these manuscripts and look at the best ones he could produce and made a much better uh, text from uh, these Latin manuscripts that were all over the place. We didn't have that kind of problem with the Byzantines. They're much more uniform. It's a, it's a, it's a tighter area that we're, uh, they're being copied in. Um, but um, since the demographics didn't change even after Jerome produced his Vulgate, now the Vulgate ends up having copies that are all over the map, while as the Byzantine text is not like that. The fourth reason for the Byzantine text dominance is John Christus, Chrysostom, or Golden Mouth, as the popularizer of the Byzantine text. Uh, Chrysostom's writings are perhaps second only to the, uh, to the New Testament as far as number of copies. We have hundreds and hundreds of them. He was thoroughly orthodox, and he used a text form that was about 75% towards the later medieval Byzantine standard that would emerge about a thousand years later. Uh, now, here's the way to think about this. Imagine a huge endorsement for only one translation of the Bible. Say you get Chuck Swindoll, Billy Graham, John Piper, D.A. Carson, the entire faculty at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, all the members of the Evangelical Theological Society, and especially Michael Patton. <laughs> and they all say, this is the translation that we must use and no other. I would think that would have an impact. And uh, that's the kind of a force that John Chrysostom had on uh, the, the Eastern uh, Church. Then fifth, African Christianity and the rise of Islam. As far as the existing Greek manuscripts are concerned, the Alexandrian text form was dominant through the first nine centuries, first eight or nine centuries. Only after that did the Byzantine text become dominant. So one of the questions I ask about, why do we have the dominance of the Byzantine text? Well, the question is when? When are you talking about? And where are you talking about? And what are you talking about? Are we talking about Greek manuscripts? Are we talking about manuscripts in Egypt? Are we talking about manuscripts in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth century? Or are we talking about just Greek manuscripts in the East after the eighth or ninth century? That's when it becomes dominant. Uh, but with the rise of Islam, Christianity in Egypt soon became almost completely overrun and manuscript uh, production of the Alexander text would be haphazard at best from this point on. So it, it dies down to a trickle after uh, the Islam invasion. Nevertheless, just as it took the King James Bible 50 years to overtake the Geneva Bible in popularity, so it took the Byzantine text several centuries to overtake the Alexandrian. So that's the fifth thing. Now the final thing is the invasion of Constantinople in um, 1453 by the Turkish uh, Muslims and the roots of the Reformation. Until 1453, the knowledge of ancient Greek had virtually disappeared from Western Europe. May, 9, May 29th, 1453, it was a Tuesday. Uh, the Turks broke through the walls of Byzantium of Constantinople, and these scribes fled into Western Europe, and they brought with them uh, a knowledge of Greek. They had been copying these manuscripts, a knowledge of ancient classical texts as well as Christian texts. The Reformation was born because of it. The Refor Reformation never would have been born unless Luther had a Greek New Testament in his hands. The Renaissance, which had started before this, got a huge kick in the butt to keep really moving well. And five years later, 1458, is the first time in Western Europe that we had any university teach a course in ancient Greece at the University of Paris, 1458. And then you start getting this, oh my gosh, what is this? I mean, the, 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 the world came out of the 
uh, dark ages because of this terrible crisis of the Turks invasion, invading uh, Byzantium and taking over the city after a year-long siege. Then March 1st, 1516, Erasmus's Greek text is published and the manuscripts are used, almost all of which uh, came from uh, Constantinople. And the point is this, the Byzantine text was isolated in the East until 1453. And even though it became the dominant text form, it was still unknown in the West. They were using the Latin Vulgate, which was quite different. 90% of all Greek manuscripts are Byzantine, but 90% of them were all produced after the 9th century and in the Greek-speaking East. So let me summarize everything here for you. Only if the transmission of the text was uniform, that is, the copying frequency is the same in all regions, would the majority text equal the original. But it wasn't uniform. It wasn't anywhere close to being uniform. And so we've given six reasons why the copying frequency was not uniform. And what we have to ask is, what do we count and when do we count? And the Byzantine text is largely late, secondary, inferior, and yet, even by itself, on a rare occasion, it can have the original wording, which we'll explore later. Thank you.